Well, good morning, everyone. I'm going to start just a little bit before uh, 801. And <clears throat> as you can see, it's actually sunny today because where I'm sitting, there's actually sun on my face. We haven't seen that for a while, so I'm, I'm sorry that I'm a little bit uh, strange looking in the sunlight. I am uh, Dr. Betsy Trowbridge. I'm the executive vice chair for the Department of Medicine, uh, and I am beginning grand rounds today. And I want to thank all of you for spending time with us this morning for increasing your learning. It's a fantastic opportunity for that. Uh, as, as you all know, I, I give some little meteorological tip and today it's that the sun is out, which I'm very thankful for. And today we have Dr. Uh, Theodore Abraham, who is with us today, and we have the Division Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine, Dr. Mohammed Hamden, who will be introducing uh, our guest speaker <clears throat> today, and we are very honored to have him. So, Mohammed, I will pass off to you. Thank you, Betsy. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Abraham. Dr. Abraham is the Meyer Friedman Distinguished Professor of Medicine and the Clinical Chief of Cardiology at the University of California, San Francisco. He's also the inaugural Chief Medical Officer for the UCSF Health Network, a 20 hospital network spanning multiple health systems in the Bay Area. Dr. Abraham went to medical school at the University of Bombay in India. He did his residency in internal medicine at Wake Forest, his cardiology fellowship at UT Southwestern, where I had the pleasure of working with him and then his imaging fellowship at the Mayo Clinic. When he was done with his training, he stayed at Mayo for a few years, and then he was recruited to Johns Hopkins, where he was promoted to full professor in medicine and radiology before moving to San Francisco. Dr. Abraham is recognized for his expertise in the field of echocardiography and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. His research focus is cardiac mechanics, spanning small and large experimental models and clinical imaging. He has over 150 peer-reviewed publications and has been NIH funded for the last 20 years. What is unique about Dr. Abraham is, is not only his, his, his science and innovation, but his ability to work with uh, collaborators across different departments. Uh, looking at his CV, he actually has collaborated with investigators in the Department of Anesthesia, Pediatrics, Clinical Care Medicine, Biomedical Engineering, Computer Science, and Mechanical Engineering. In addition to being, again, a, a great uh, physician scientist, he's also a great teacher. Uh, he has mentored over 27 students and postdoc fellows and has helped establish several imaging fellowship programs. When he was at Hopkins, he was the founder and director of the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Center of Excellence and Athletic Heart Clinic, the Advanced Echo Fellowship Program, and the Advanced Cardiac Imaging Fellowship Program. In 2019, he received the Richard Pop Teaching and Mentorship Award this is a very prestigious award given yearly at the American Society of Echocardiography in recognition of an outstanding teacher nominated by his or her students and peers. When I looked at the selection criteria, they looked not only at your accomplishment as an educator, but also on the number of students and fellows you train and, of course, their letters. Dr. Abraham also is a great citizen. He serves on many editorial boards, including Jack, Jack Cardiovascular Imaging, Journal of American Society of Echocardiography, and CERC Imaging. He served on the board of directors for the American Society of Echocardiography, and he was the program chair for the 2020 scientific sessions. Dr. Abraham is also a member of the Association of University Cardiologists, where recently we, our path crossed again. Finally, it's, it should be noted that in addition to all his accomplishments and in the triple threat that clearly he is, uh, Dr. Abraham also is a leader and visionary in healthcare delivery. He currently serves on several committees including the UCSF Major Capital Budget and Health Enterprise Portfolio Management Committees. He's also currently helping lead the UCSF Health Strategic Plan for the next five years. So with that, it gives me a great pleasure again to, to, uh, to have uh, Ted join us this morning. He will be discussing his favorite subject, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and the title of his presentation is The Hyping Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy, Pushing Designer Drugs and Ditching the Scalp. Dr. Abraham. Thank you, Dr. Hamden, for that very kind uh, introduction. And it's wonderful uh, to reconnect with you uh, after you came on uh, as faculty at UT Southwestern. I was uh, still a fellow, uh, and then obviously at uh, AUC. And, and thank you for the 
kind honor of uh, letting me do grand rounds at University of Wisconsin this morning. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, mostly about uh, the clinical aspects of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I do not have any disclosures except for my involvement uh, in uh, certain uh, recent drug trials for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Here are the learning objectives that you should have already received. I'm going to start with this 19-year-old college student who was um, running on a treadmill around 7 p.m. at night in Northern Virginia and, um, and fell to the floor. Uh, he was the only one in the gym. A janitor in the next room heard this noise, comes in and watches this gentleman lying on the floor, rushes over, calls, activates 911, and starts CPR, having never done CPR before and never trained in CPR, uh, but is able to um, continue CPR until um, the uh, EMS gets there and they see a shockable ventricular tachycardia heart rhythm, which was successfully cardioverted. Uh, he undergoes uh, uh, full evaluation, and this uh, is not his actual echocardiogram, but uh, is uh, an echocardiogram that uh, is similar to uh, someone uh, and more dramatic, which is why I'm putting it here, is significant septal hypertrophy, which resulted in a diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He had an ICD implanted and was sent home, and then saw me a few weeks later in clinic. Uh, what was interesting was his family history. Now, if this is the patient, he had one older brother, and, it and uh, when you asked him uh, about his parents, he said that his dad had died suddenly walking to work, collapsed on the street. He was 39 years of age when the patient was about five years of age. We screened his brother, who also was found to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So what is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? It's a common genetic heart disease. It occurs in about one in 300 people who are gene positive. The estimated worldwide burden is about 20 million, and it is an uh, inherited through an autosomal dominant pattern. It results from G, uh, mutations in genes uh, encoding for sarcomeric proteins, and the most common ones are the beta mycin heavy chain gene, the mycin binding protein C gene, uh, and the troponin genes. Most patients will actually lead a relatively healthy uh, lifestyle and have a uh, enjoy a normal lifespan. However, in a certain proportion of patients, they could present with angina, heart failure, and arrhythmias, including sudden cardiac death, as this patient and his father did. And in fact, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the most common cause of sudden death in the young in young athletes, especially at high school and college age athletes. The key features of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are ventricular hypertrophy, as the as the, uh, as the name suggests, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, and I'll show you pictures and movies of that. And as a result of these two features, which narrow the left ventricular outflow tract, there are high uh, outflow tract gradients resulting in outflow tract obstruction. But the interesting feature here is that any of these key findings can be present or absent. For example, ventricular hypertrophy may vary in degree and location. Systolic atrial motion may or may not be present and if present may be a variable severity. And lastly, as a result, outflow tract obstruction may or not may not be present at rest and may only be inducible with uh, provocative maneuvers, including exercise. Lastly, another interesting fact is that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy typically presents with normal or hyperdynamic heart function. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is unique in two ways uh, in my mind, and in many ways, but certainly in two ways that are striking. One is, it is truly the non-cardiomyopathy that is at rest and with exercise stress, as you watch in the movies here, the heart function is uh, normal or supernormal. So conventional methodologies, including visual or Simpson's, uh, I mean, ejection fraction calculations are not very useful because the heart function itself is normal, you know, even under conditions of stress. Next, as I mentioned, the key features are highly variable. As a result, Every person, every patient has to be individually tested and evaluated. So I'd say that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as a condition is custom designed for imaging. Whether it's looking at morphology or trying to characterize tissue uh, features, looking at function with more sophisticated measures such as myocardial mechanics that I'm gonna talk more about, uh, or looking at microvascular perfusion because all these folks have significant micro microvascular disease, Imaging encompasses all aspects of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy management from diagnosis to risk assessment and prognostication. Imaging is critical and we do a huge spectrum of tests. Almost everybody gets echocardiography. Uh, vast majority of patients have magnetic resonance. Uh, patients presenting with angina specifically 
uh, and mostly receive uh, PET scanning in our institution. Those who cannot have CT scan, uh, cannot have MRI scans, have computer tomography, and in preoperative patients, we almost always do a transesophageal uh, echocardiogram. And the intent here is to customize uh, the imaging uh, algorithm for a particular patient to answer a specific question that enables and facilitates a treatment decision, and lastly, to monitor response to therapy and course of disease. Here are several videos, and you can see in the first top right-hand corner here, uh, right there, you see uh, systolic anterior motion. And what I mean by that is that the mitral valve typically at, at systole will close and stay in the midline. Here you can see that's bending over and touching the septum. The next uh, image right here uh, shows the same uh, in a zoomed in view. If you go to the bottom, uh, I'm sorry, you go to the, the last one on the right here, you see severe left ventricular hypertrophy. There's no classic SAM right at the valvular level, but there's significant narrowing right where my cursor is, which is more at the mid ventricular level. Uh, if you go to the bottom panel of images on the bottom left, uh, you see that there's color flow evidence of obstruction or turbulence in the outflow tract, and there's the classic mitral regurgitation uh, occurring um, and directed posteriorly. Uh, there's another image of SAM in the middle right here. Uh, and lastly, uh, and we'll get back to this gentleman, this is a 16-year-old kid in the bottom right-hand side, has mild left ventricular hypertrophy and no systolic anterior motion. So again, a wide variety of, uh, of presentations. We do contrast in a majority of patients. It's mainly to define the apex, uh, to understand uh, how severe the hypertrophy is. Uh, and we know now that contrast, echo are more concordant with MRI findings. And lastly, also to exclude uh, HCM. In the, I'll start with the top right-hand corner here uh, and severe hypertrophy in this 22-year-old grad student who you can see that his uh, septum is about four centimeters. His intramural arteries are so dilated that you can actually see contrast even within his septum. In the bottom right here is a gentleman who was followed, in fact, uh, not in my clinic, but in our cardiology division for almost eight years as someone having uh, severe concentric hypertrophy in the context of hypertension and chronic renal disease and did not have great images. And you, as you can see, even with contrast, his images are not that great. But what contrast and MRI did show is that he really did not have concentric hypertrophy, but what he had was uh, apical hypertrophy uh, right there. And the bottom, which you do not see well, the base was not hypertrophied and in fact thinned out. So this is a classic apical hypertrophy that's missed for multiple years in our own practice. This is a gentleman on the left bottoms uh, who came in and was thought to have apical HCM uh, and was referred for abnormal T waves uh, and thought to have abnormal, I mean, have apical HCM, but uh, contrast echo showed that actually there is no hypertrophy and we were able to exclude apical HCM uh, with contrast in this gentleman. So next is uh, magnetic resonance. You can see that the display of the anatomy uh, is uh, very nice and exquisite. Spatial resolution is very high. I'm gonna talk in the next slide about tissue characterization. However, a claustrophobia may prevent folks from getting in. Metal and certain devices in patients might uh, preclude them from having an MRI. And lastly, uh, you don't get the, uh, the elaborate hemodynamics that you can get on echocardiography uh, with MRI, but it certainly provides incremental information. In this case, uh, as you see on the left-hand side is a CINE showing um, significant septal hypertrophy uh, highlighted in that circle. And then if you look uh, on the right-hand side uh, in the late gadolinium images, you see patchy uh, scar uh, that can be actually quantified. In those that have claustrophobia, metal, or you want additional perfusion, which you can of course get with MRI as well, but if you want CT perfusion, you can do computed tomography. And this is someone who does not have classic uh, HCM, uh, but has a sub-apical HCM. If you see where my arrow is, his true apex is actually not that bad. Uh, and then you can see on the right-hand side, uh, again, significant sub-apical HCM. And a cross section at that level shows you severe uh, hypertrophy at the subapical level. Again, it's tough to get scar information. The, uh, although there are data on late uh, contrast enhancement, they're not as uh, detailed or informative as the MRI data, and you cannot get hemodynamics. In some patients uh, with uh, chest pain, uh, we do proceed to uh, ammonia PET scan that 
can give us perfusion and coronary flow reserve. This is a 23 year old uh, girl uh, actually who was uh, in active military and had intractable chest pain that was getting worse over a three year period. She now can barely walk across uh, from her um, uh, from her bedroom to the front of the house and has had five angiograms in the last two years and was sent to us uh, and to psychiatry at the same time. You know, they weren't sure what the problem was because the angiograms are normal. She had three uh, spec scans uh, and those uh, nuclear per regular nuclear perfusion scans were also uh, completely normal. So they thought that yes, she has a thickened septum, but there does not seem to be any good reason for her to have such severe angina or what appears to be angina. So we did. We had a significant experience with ammonia PET by then. So we did an ammonia PET, and you can see here that there is stress-induced uh, ischemia in the uh, in the septal wall, and that ischemia is actually co-localized with the maximal thickness uh, and uh, where the scar is, which is what the arrow is pointing to. So going back to mechanics, uh, let's start with that 16-year-old kid, a two-sport athlete who had a scholarship uh, to a college in North Carolina, had uh, abnormal T waves. Uh, at a pre-participation physical, his initial echo was completely normal, an ejection fraction was normal, but his septum was 1.3 centimeters, not quite meeting the diagnostic criteria that I'll visit with you in a second uh, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, so he was sent to us and we thought this was most likely just athletic training. Uh, and so um, we didn't know what to do. We did, uh, and at that point, uh, like everybody else that we were doing, do uh, did uh, cardiac mechanics. Now, cardiac mechanics, um, you know, mechanics and, and strain, which is a concept that I'm going to talk about, came about really looking at the properties of rubber uh, in the 1940s. And the heart, like rubber, is a soft, elastic, compressible body. And if you look at the video here, the heart, if you took a muscle strip of the heart, it contracts uh, and, and or rather shortens and lengthens in one direction and thickens in the opposite direction. And um, in animal studies, uh, most folks would uh, would uh, attach a, a strip of muscle and look at uh, these properties. That is, how is the muscle length changing over time? And that's uh, a shortening in systole and then a, di uh, di a return to resting length in diastole. And you can quantify the extent, that is how much shortening there is and how fast the shortening occurs. And then um, that's contraction, that's relaxation. Um, and initially in 1973, this concept was used to look at the uh, passive uh, stiffness of the heart. And this was by uh, Mursky and Parmley. Parmley was still in Boston, as Dr. Hamden probably remembers. Parmley then spent uh, a significant amount of time at UCSF. Soon after that, uh, at Stanford, Ingalls and his group said, you know what, this is a concept that can be used in live in vivo human scanning. So in everybody having cardiac surgery, they sewed metal beads onto the heart. And if you look at the X-ray image uh, in the right-hand side here, these metal beads were then x-rayed under, under cine alphoroscopy. You could see how the heart, uh, that segment of the heart was contracting. In 1988, Ed Shapiro and, and Zerhuni at Hopkins did the same thing using uh, MRI tagging. So you apply tags to the heart and when the tags bend, you can see how much deformation there is. About 10 years later, um, a, a smart uh, engineer in Norway decided that the same thing uh, can be done uh, with, um, you know, if you look at motion of the heart, you can do the same thing with ultrasound, whether it's tissue Doppler uh, or um, or a speckle tracking, and you can track a single point in the heart and get uh, tracings of uh, motion from that single point, or what you really want to know is whether a segment contracts uh, or lengthens, and you can do that also, and that that is called strain or strain rate. Uh, and that's Andreas Heimdall, uh, and strain again is change in length. Now the the concept of strain or deformation mapping is that you start with the original length and you try to figure out how much contraction or change in length there is uh, in the muscle. That is what we applied in this 16 year old kid. So remember that the apex looked normal. The base had a borderline left ventricular hypertrophy. The um, yellow uh, tracing is off the apex. The other is off the base. And what is um, obvious here is that when the rest of the heart and, and by that, I mean the apex is contracting and uh, has a normal contraction going down to about negative 25%. The actual basal segment that is that looks normal, feels normal, except for borderline hypertrophy is actually lengthening or is dyskinetic. Similarly, when the rest of the heart is relaxing, which is this upstroke of the, of the apical tracing, 
then there's a very weak contraction of the basal segment. So we weren't sure if this was real or just an artifact. So we repeated this in about six months. And then again, a month after that, and he was detrained. That is, we asked him to stop athletic training, but we got essentially the same results. At that point, we said, let's screen his family and do genotyping. And interestingly, he came back with a myosin heavy chain mutation and his mother was positive for the myosin heavy chain mutation. So here we were able to close the loop and, and diagnose him with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So how do we manage uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, two thirds of whom are obstructive? Uh, the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is made primarily by presence of hypertrophy because the other features are just too variable. So hypertrophy exceeding 15 millimeters or 13 if you have family history or, or gene positive clinches the diagnosis uh, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is in the context of not having any other condition, either hypertension or a valve condition that could explain the hypertrophy or an infiltrative cardiomyopathy. So if you go back to this kid, he had a 13 millimeter septum, but was gene positive and now had family history. So he uh, did fulfill the diagnosis. Now, once you make the diagnosis, we look at outflow tract gradients and the magic number is 30 millimeters of mercury. And using that, we separate uh, the group into uh, three buckets. Obstructive is uh, the group of patients who have uh, a rest and provocable gradient that exceeds 30. Labile obstructive, your rest gradient is less than 30, but the provocable gradient is above 30 as the pictures show to the right, which are Doppler pictures. And the numbers there are the great peak gradients. And the last group is non-obstructive, that is both at rest and uh, with provocation, your gradients are below 30. So once you meet guidelines criteria, what we do is depending on where you end up and assuming this is obstructive, which is what I'm talking about, we, we go ahead and start them on some sort of medical therapy, at least in our institution, we, we try beta blockers first, uh, calcium blockers with or without disoparamide. If these therapies fail, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about novel therapies, but then we go on to some septal reduction strategy, which is obviously uh, non-medical. Uh, and the two big ones are uh, uh, septal ablation that I'm going to talk about and surgical myectomy, where you cut off uh, the offending part of the septum. Ablation is preferred in people who are older, who strongly do not want to have uh, a myectomy or a sternotomy, or who are high risk uh, for surgery. Myectomy is preferred in younger folks uh, who will benefit from a complete and definitive resolution of their obstruction. Those who are low surgical risk, if there is surgical expertise at the institution, um, uh, expertise in bypass or valve surgery does not equal expertise in myectomy is what uh, we found out uh, the hard way several times. Uh, and lastly, if there are several anatomic features which need to be surgically addressed, whether it's valves, you need a concomitant bypass, uh, whether you need cords to be reconstructed, if you need reconstruction or shaving of the pap muscle, if there is an apical aneurysm uh, or apical uh, hypertrophy that needs to be remodeled, or if you have diffuse hypertrophy that the septal ablation cannot get to. And lastly, if you have a previous septal ablation uh, or two, and uh, you still need uh, your obstruction to be taken care of, then surgery is probably the better way to go. These are some of the surgical techniques. The original surgery by Dr. Morrow at the NIH was what's called a trough uh, myectomy or a Morrow myectomy, where they used an instrument called a pituitary rongeur and created a trough in that hypertrophied septum. Now that used to work, but was not 100% effective, not maybe 50% uh, effective. Gordon Danielson and the group at the Mayo then decided that the main reason for that is that you did not remove enough bulk of the septum. So they did have devised the Mayo or the extended myectomy, which is what is mostly followed now uh, uh, across the world, which is they extend the incision both side to side and deep down towards the apex. Uh, and you do it in multiple ways. This is a two cut myectomy. You also uh, do all everything else that you need to do to get rid of the obstruction, whether it's removing accessory cords, whether it's shaving down a pap muscle that's extremely uh, hypertrophied, whether there are uh, muscular cords that are inserting into the mitral valve that needs to be excised. And lastly, I'll give you an example of this, but if there's significant global hypertrophy extending into the apex, um, again, Hartzell Schaff at the Mayo uh, devised a technique where they come in through the apex rather than the, uh, the typical approach and debulk the apical myocardium uh, so that they can provide some um, additional space and real estate within the heart. In those that do not want to have a myectomy uh, uh, and uh, prefer a percutaneous approach, uh, there is a septal ablation. This is a beautiful graphic from uh, WashU uh, 
uh, and you can see that uh, you uh, angiographically uh, identify a septal perforator that subtends or uh, supplies uh, perfuses the offending uh, se septal segment. Uh, ultrasound is used. Here is someone, and I hope you can see that, has basal septal hypertrophy. Uh, the septal hypertrophy is also confirmed to be the point of maximal obstruction. You can see that on the cath table, the maximal uh, gradient was 102 at rest. And then we instill contrast through uh, the dedicated septal perforator, confirm that the contrast is lighting up the offending septal segment, and now we know that we're in the right place, and then we instill alcohol in there, uh, and alcohol just happens to be a great uh, ultrasound uh, contrast agent as well, so you can confirm that the alcohol actually went in the right place, and you can see on the bottom right that there's an instantaneous drop in gradient from 102 down to 12. Now, there's always a question whether this is a stunned myocardium versus an infarcted myocardium. We don't know until several months later. And sometimes if it is truly stunning uh, or was an incomplete infarct, there might be reappearance of gradient, at which point you can decide to either reablate if there was other per septal perforators that you could address or send them uh, for a myectomy. There are other techniques to try to ablate the septum and, and hopefully Dr. Hamden uh, would have an appreciation for this. Uh, the first uh, is this group that looked at uh, endocardial ablation, both from the right side and the left side, uh, using standard ra radio frequency uh, ca uh, ablation catheters that are used in electrophysiology. So you can see there, uh, they did transeptal in one case, uh, endocardial ablation with reduction in gradients, uh, which the uh, arrows are pointing to. Then, then this group from China uh, went one step ahead and said, you know, we don't have to go endocardially, we can actually go epicardially. And, and you can see in the figure here that they come from the apex uh, and in the middle diagram here, it is completely echo guided, where the ablation needle is inserted through the apex into the middle of the septum, right into the basal septum. That's where the tip is. And under ultrasound guidance, you ablate. And again, the ablated area is echogenic, uh, as uh, pointed out by the arrow. And you see a, a dramatic drop in gradient. You can see here again, uh, they did uh, 15 or so patients. And if you go to the bottom figure, this is contrast echo, you see a nice perfused uh, basal septum to the left, and then a huge signal void where there's an ablation uh, to the right. So a pretty large mass uh, of ablated tissue. And you can see here that both wall thickness and gradients are reduced uh, at uh, three months and six months after the procedure. So that's in standard basal septal uh, hypertrophy. But as I said, HCM comes in many flavors and the hypertrophy and the offending segment could be anywhere. It could be, it could one be normal as shown in A or the classic basal septal as in B or more mid septal as in C, or in fact, anywhere in uh, the left ventricle. And this was a case, uh, I was still in Baltimore at this time and um, a 60 year old gentleman with hypertension and dyslipidemia, no active cardiac issues, was raising a toast for his nephew's wedding and uh, started getting diaphoretic and uh, short of breath. And he thought that he had just had too much scotch to drink and not enough food to eat. So he stopped speaking, told his son to take him outside uh, or walk with him outside. So he goes outside and in a few minutes is getting really uh, uh, Presyncopal. So his son decides to drive him to the closest ER, which happens to be the Johns Hopkins Bayview uh, emergency room. Uh, and there he's found to uh, be in monomorphic VT. He gets shocked uh, in an internormal sinus rhythm, but had ECG abnormalities when he came into the ER, uh, I mean, post shock, uh, and also a troponin leak. So he had, uh, he was transferred to the main uh, Hopkins hospital, had an angiogram uh, done that night and no major epicardial disease, but they thought they saw something in the PDA that they, that like all good angiographers and interventionalists decided to angioplasty. So the next morning he's referred uh, for a post MI echocardiogram. And uh, we had lots of really astute sonographers who uh, had done a fair amount of HCM imaging and they said, this doesn't look like an MI. And it's interesting that this middle portion of the heart looks really thickened and it's uh, obliterating the LV cavity. Then if you look at the uh, top, middle, you see that the LV is completely closed in uh, at the mid-level uh, where uh, they took a cross-section. If you look at the bottom middle uh, figure here, you see that there seems to be high gradients by Doppler. And lastly, if you go more apically, there was an interesting blob, an echo density in the posterior wall. You see this big ball sitting within the 
um, within the LV cavity. So they went on to uh, do apical imaging. And if you look at the left-hand side figure, there's two things. One is there's something that looks like a clot sitting on the top left-hand side, which is the posterior wall of the heart. And that's confirmed on uh, short axis imaging right here where my cursor is. And then uh, you can also see on the left-hand side that the color flow Doppler shows significant color turbulence or acceleration in that segment that is around the apex, but just below the apex. And if you put a Doppler probe across that, you get a gradient of 110. Remember the normal gradient is less than 10, usually in the five range. So if you go to the graphic on the right, you have a echo density at the, in the apex, which looks like a clot, and you have very high gradients just shy of that where there's significant uh, LV narrowing. So this person had an MRI. You can look at the, uh, the cine um, on the left, uh, but I highlight the key findings on the right, which is severe midventricular hypertrophy, a thinned out apex with a clot uh, sitting uh, in the apex. So this person uh, had an ICD placed, was sent home, and then came back a few weeks later uh, for a surgical myectomy. And this was a more complex myectomy. We went through a standard, um, this is the Royal We, obviously. The surgeon went through a, a erototomy approach and did an extended septal myectomy. Then they go back through the apex and they excise the aneurysmal scarred apex. They do a thrombectomy, remove the thrombus, debulk whatever septum they can from the apical approach, and lastly, put a pericardial patch uh, once, the, uh, once the healthy myocardial segments are sewn together. So again, this gentleman uh, did extremely well. I followed him for about six or seven years after his surgery. He was back on his boat on the Chesapeake Bay without any complaints and back to normal, literally. But, but is surgery the only answer? And I think, interestingly, in the last couple of years, there have been uh, developments that have changed uh, the paradigm of treatment for obstructive uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you remember that the genes encoding for sarcomeric proteins are the ones that go awry. And, and if you look at what provides the contractile mechanism for the heart, it is the actin myosin crossbridge. So the uh, crossbridge reacts or, uh, or couples to actually create these sliding segments and cause the heart muscle to contract. A, in transgenic mice, they found that in HCM, these cross bridges result in a much stronger power stroke. And this is why you have a hyperdynamic circulation, uh, hyperdynamic state in the heart. The number of cross bridges that are formed are much higher or the percentage is much higher. And the cross bridge, these two linking actin myosin links don't dissociate as easily as they would in a normal person. So they have uh, an additional diastolic problem. So um, a, couple, a pharmaceutical company decided to attack that uh, particular mechanism and they did high throughput screening of multiple drugs and landed up with Mavicamptin, which is a selective modulator of cardiac mice and ATPase. In transgenic mice, it was found to weaken the power stroke, so do the exact opposite of what, what the mutation would do. It resulted in fewer cross bridges and it hastened or uh, quickened uh, dissociation. In the same mice, it was able to prevent left ventricular hypertrophy and reduce the key features of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy pathologically, which is myocyte disarray and uh, interstitial fibrosis. So that resulted in the first early phase uh, two study, which was called a pioneer HCM study. This was 11 subjects who were symptomatic and at high gradients. The primary endpoint was a decrease in the gradient. And if you see here, this is average for 10 patients. One of the patients I think did not uh, complete the study. You can see that in 12 weeks of treatment, there's a significant drop, a dramatic drop in, um, in left ventricular outflow tract gradients. And four weeks after stopping the drug, the gradients go right back up. Also, Mavicampton was very safe and effective. So this is the drop in exercise gradient, an impressive drop, a mean of 125 down to 19. I'd say 80% of the time with surgery, you don't get such impressive results. Also, in 10 out of 10, the gradients were reduced. In 9 out of 10, they were reduced to less than 30, which, as you know, is the definition of obstructive HCM by week two. And by week 12, which was the end of the study, in 8 out of 10 patients, the gradient stayed low. The drug was well tolerated, 80% reported mild side effects, 20% more moderate side effects, but interestingly, only in 60% of, uh, in fact, in 60% of them, 
the side effects were unrelated to mavicamptin. Also, biomarkers such as high sensitivity troponins were not elevated with mavicamptin. Here's a list of some of the um, side effects that were reported by the patients in this study. So a successful small uh, early phase two study led to a larger uh, phase two study, in fact, was the largest randomized controlled uh, trial in HCM with 251 patients in 68 sites across 13 countries. And we were fortunate uh, and, and, um, and honored to be part of this study. What did that show? That rest gradient was reduced. Uh, that ejection fraction, although you expect the ejection fraction to be reduced, it did not go down. So rest gradient went down substantially as you see these curves separate within four weeks and stay the same for the entire 30 weeks of the study, but the ejection fraction stayed normal. Interestingly, pro-BNP dropped and stayed low. Troponin levels dropped and stayed low. So again, very nice results. Again, validated that Mavicampton was safe and effective. If you look at New York Heart class, 65% had at least a sing single class drop in New York Heart class. post exercise gradient dropped in 74%, and in almost 60%, it was below the diagnostic criteria, diagnostic criteria for obstruction. And lastly, um, there was a increase in exercise tolerance as evidenced by an improvement uh, in peak uh, VO2. Again, it was effective uh, and safe, low dropout rate, no participants withdrew due to uh, reduced EF uh, or due to symptoms of heart failure. There were no uh, serious side effects higher number of side of serious uh, side effects or adverse effects occurred in the placebo gof group compared to the Mavicampton group. And lastly, we were all concerned about atrial fibrillation. And interestingly, there's no difference in AFib rates uh, in the placebo arm versus the treatment arm. And the proof is in the pictures here. If you look at this on the top uh, left-hand side, as a this is a 60-year-old college professor who uh, lives in the Bay Area who came in and uh, she was on the lowest dose of Mavicampton. We know that now after the study, but, uh, but this is uh, pre-study. You can see that there's significant systolic anterior motion. And if you look bottom, there is impressive, moderate to severe or even severe mitral regurgitation going to the left atrium and a significant color obstruction uh, in the outflow tract. Uh, after Mavicampton, you can see that the mitral valve, and I'm going to try to use my cursor here, the mitral valve it stays in the middle, so that it does not touch the septum and does not obstruct the LVOT, and that is validated on color Doppler, where you do not see the same amount of turbulence in the left ventricular alpha tract. And what I was impressed with is there's almost no MR. There's trace MR. So this was impressive. Literally, I know this patient, the no reason I know the story is because during the study phase, we're all blinded. In the open label extension, this is what we saw within a week, one week of 2.5 milligrams of the dose. So again, uh, let's look at the numbers. Doppler gradients at rest pre was 130, Valsalva under 150. Within a week of treatment, rest down to eight and Valsalva down to 12. I, I have to say, ha having done this for about 19 years, I was personally very impressed. I'm going to go in, in the last part of my talk, uh, talk a little bit about work we've done with strain imaging, which uh, uh, has been a, a pet topic of mine. And the reason I'm showing this really is because I think uh, some of the knowledge we've gained impacts directly on how we treat patients and diagnose patients. I showed you the example of the 16 year old kid that had abnormal strain and ended up having HCM. And this is sort of a continuation of that. The 16 year old kid was African American. We know that in African American young athletes, especially in the high school age, they may have abnormal T waves and abnormal septal hypertrophy. So we decided to say, look at, is there a wider problem just with racial differences uh, in how the HCM phenotype presents? Now, we know that the HCM is prevalent in blacks similar to whites. It's about one in 500 having the manifest uh, phenotype. In an interesting autopsy study, uh, Barry Marin found that 55% of athletes who died suddenly and had an autopsy and were found to have HCM, 55% of them were black. He then went on and said, how many blacks are in treatment at centers of, uh, of excellence or in HCM focused centers? And only 8% of the patient population in the centers were African-American. 
around the same time, we had garnered a substantial percentage of African-American patients in our HCM center at Hopkins, and now they were close to 30%. So we said, you know, we have now more than three times the number that's reported in these national averages. So maybe we have an opportunity to look at why there are more African-Americans dying suddenly of HCM. Is this an, uh, an issue of underdiagnosis, or is this a problem with under-treatment or both? So the first question we said is, is the presentation different? And if you look at it, several presentations or several symptoms are the same, whether it's dyspnea, uh, presence uh, of syncope, New York heart class, and certain key features, they're generally the same, EF, diastolic dysfunction grade, and septal thickness. There was more hypertension, but not significantly so in the African-American group, but they had more angina, and this was the part that was very interesting. They had lower gradients, so they were not as obstructed. But despite the lower gradients, they had more, uh, they had a lower exercise time. So the exercise capacity was worse. We then said maybe they just have a different sudden cardiac death risk profile. There are certain criteria that are used in HCM, and I've listed them before. But interestingly, African Americans and Caucasians had the exact same profile. There was no significant difference between the two. There's a minor uh, difference in prevalence of a, uh, a thick wall in African Americans. We then went on and said, is there a difference in the pattern of hypertrophy and in strain? Because there's nothing else left. They look pretty similar at this point. And this is where we struck uh, some gold, which is apical HCM was more prevalent uh, and apical hypertrophy was more prevalent in African-Americans. Also, interestingly, global longitudinal strain that we thought would be lower in people with obstruction was actually lower in African-Americans. So, and this is despite a normal EF. So both groups had normal EF or hyperdynamic EF. Both groups were not different as far as EF was concerned, but strain was lower in the African-American group, which, which had no obstruction. So we thought that maybe HCM has a more myopathic uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and that might explain uh, the poor exercise tolerance. So what did that teach us and what did we implement in our practice? One is that key features of HCM are missing. So there's a high likelihood for under-recognition of HCM. There is no asymmetric septal hypertrophy. Remember, most of the hypertrophy is in the apex, or is more global. There's no systolic anterior motion. So you don't get obstruction, which is what most people, most general cardiologists are looking for, or even generalists are looking for uh, a murmur or uh, something that looks like an obstruction. Uh, number two, as I mentioned, HCM is probably more myopathic in African-Americans. Next, um, uh, that Interestingly, in several of the patients that we saw, despite significant hypertrophy, because they were African-American is what we think, uh, they, all the hypertrophy was attributed to hypertension. And we had folks on two or even three antihypertensives when what they really had was, high, was hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this was with no record of a high blood pressure. So what did we do? We do repeated blood pressures or even ambulatory 24-hour blood pressure monitoring. We screen the rest of the family. We genotype them like we did in that kid. And we recognize that hypertension and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can coexist in about 30% of the patients. We then said, you know what, strain is low in this African-American population and seem to suggest a myopathic pattern. Does strain predict outcomes? And this was done by Han Yun Liu, who looked at strain. 16% is considered normal, and we saw that people with worse than 16% strain did worse. And if you separated them into quartiles, those that had a strain of sorry, strain of less than 10% were the ones that were really a, a high risk group. Uh, again, if you had a strain of less than 10% and you compared them to patients with HCM with a strain of better than 16%, those with less than 10% had about a three and a half times risk of events. And this was death, heart failure, uh, AFib and ventricular tachycardias. So we went back and said, yes, we have three hemodynamic profiles of HCM. And the prevailing thought process is that HCM is a disease of obstruction. Obstructive patients are the ones that have symptoms and complications that should be treated aggressively, and non-obstructives really do not deserve much attention. But again, in our clinic, we found that a lot of non-obstructives, uh, like the uh, like the African American group we described, were not that benign. So the question we asked, and Heraclius Posio has helped us with this, is: Is non-obstructive HCM truly benign? If you looked at the guidelines, they said it's benign. If you looked at the position statements and consensus statements, it said that majority of non-obstructive patients are going to have a stable course 
no complications, no need for aggressive treatment. So we looked at about 300 of these patients, did lots of imaging, and found that non-obstructive HCM actually had a significantly higher history of VTVF coming into our study and more ICDs, no differences in the rest. If you looked at VTVF, significantly higher in non-obstructives. In all the patients that had ICDs implanted, we looked at ICD appropriate discharge rates. They were much higher in non-obstructives, significantly low in obstructives and non-existent in the labile obstructive group. If you look at event-free survival, again, worst in non-obstructives. This is even after adjusting for a whole host of factors, history of non-sustained VT, New York heart class, SCAR, PET scanning, EF, all, all these echo factors. So we said, why, why are there more events? Is this a pathobiologic phenomena? Is there some basis to this? Or is it just a statistical issue? We know that there are two key features pathologically. One is myocardial fibrosis and intramural uh, coronary artery hyperplasia that prevents the heart from being able to react and, and perfuse better with stress. And we had two nice techniques, ammonia PET that looked at perfusion and gadolinium uh, fibrosis mapping. What did we find? That non-obstructive HCM patients had a larger scar size, 21% mean scar size compared to 11% in labile. And also, if you looked at the percentage of patients with very large scar, there were significantly more. A third of the patients had at least 20% of uh, scar uh, involving 20% of the LV mass uh, in, in the non-obstructive group. Similarly, with microvascular ischemia, 82% of, of non-obstructive patients had microvascular ischemia compared to only 54% with labile. So if you look at the whole group and you compare everybody here between the three hemodynamic groups, despite a similar level of hypertrophy, non-obstructive patients had more scar, significantly more microvascular ischemia, and during the follow-up period had significantly more uh, VTVF events. So certainly non-obstructive HCM is not benign, uh, and probably needs a lot more characterization and more nuanced, thoughtful restratification. And the, and the side story here is that labile HCM is likely a more benign uh, variety. So to end this talk, we went from mechanics to myectomy, and, and lastly, I talked about Mavicampton and modulating uh, myosin uh, mechanics and myosin kinetics, um, and, and I hope this was a, a, a nice a summary of the co most common inherited heart disease, where imaging forms the basis of diagnosis, prognostication, uh, monitoring response to therapy, and is mostly uh, multimodal. Once you diagnose HCM, you have a third of patients who are non-obstructive. They're either asymptomatic and need no therapy or need medical therapy, and if they don't do well, uh, will need a heart transplant because there are no other definitive therapies at this time. If you're obstructive, which is two thirds of the population, you have a whole host of features going from open surgical approaches to radio frequency, radio frequency ablation or alcohol ablation, and more recently, uh, novel drug uh, therapy. So again, a uh, uh, shout out to our team here that is the UCSF uh, Clinical Center of Excellence uh, out in uh, San Francisco. And uh, although I didn't present a lot of my research, uh, most of these folks are at Hopkins, uh, everything we've done uh, has been a team sport and uh, as a result of a lot of our collaborations with multiple groups uh, within, the, within the system. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Hamden, for your very kind uh, int uh, introduction and invitation uh, to present uh, Grand Rounds at University of Wisconsin, a snippet. Uh, University of Wisconsin was the first place I interviewed after my fellowship at Mayo. I decided to stay back at Mayo. Uh, I met uh, uh, Dr. Rocco at that time, who has uh, remained a role model, friend, and mentor uh, over the years, uh, so it's uh, great to, uh, to be presenting there, uh, and thank you. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you for that incredibly uh, impressive overview of cardiomyopathy. I, I learned uh, quite a few uh, tidbits that I had not known before, Ted, so thank you. And we have some questions coming in, uh, including from one of the people that you had mentioned. Let me just go here to our questions and answers. So uh, one of our questions from one of our cardiologists is you described a major uh, uh, phenotypic variability in, in HCM, can genetic testing distinguish it from hypertensive heart disease? And does genetic testing help with sudden death prediction? Uh, great question. And again, in the interest of time, I did not go uh, too much into detail there. But uh, one 
in, in most population studies, a positive return on genetic testing occurs in all comers at about 40 to 50% of people with fully confirmed morphologic HCM. So the, the, the rates are not that high. So if it's positive, it's highly informative. So the answer is yes, if it's positive, it helps clinch the diagnosis. However, if it's negative or if it's a variant of unknown significance, it is not so helpful. In people with family history, the positivity rates are slightly higher at about 60%. Um, number two, um, I think uh, I hopefully answer both questions. Uh, it, it, uh, oh, sorry. Genetics does not seem to explain the variability. So for example, I had a mother with four sons, all of them carrying the beta-mycin heavy chain mutation, and all of them had completely different phenotypes and completely variable susceptibility to sudden cardiac death. So two of them ended up with ICDs. The other three did not need ICTs. One of them needed a uh, septal myectomy but due to severe um, uh, obstructive uh, uh, phenotype. The others did not need a myectomy and one of them actually did, needed no treatment, was completely fine. There was one who was symptomatic and was not obstructive. So the answer is no. So the use of genetics and clinical care is somewhat limited due to those facts. Thank you. And uh, from uh, Dr. Rocco, since he uh, said specifically, Ted, great lecture. Um, does Mavicampton change the morphology of the left ventricle over time or does it stay stable? Uh, thank you, Dr. Rocco, and, and as always, uh, sorry that uh, we didn't see each other at ASC that uh, has become our yearly uh, sort of uh, pilgrimage and, and uh, meeting point. Uh, so, great question. We do know uh, that um, with CMR, it seems like the wall thickness does go down a little bit, but it was only a 30-week study, uh, and there were only 35 uh, or 50 patients who had CMR at, uh, at uh, baseline and end study. With ECHO, as you know, it's just difficult to measure. And interestingly, the core lab did not measure ECHO wall thickness at the end of the study. So they have, they uh, measured standard wall thickness and Dr. Rocco would appreciate that, not the max wall thickness. So we did not see much, uh, there was no difference. Now, there, there was a statistical difference but it looked like the wall thickness increased in the placebo group, which is what drove the difference. But in the treated group, there was no change in wall, thick, uh, wall thickness. So I think, I don't know for sure. My guess is that over time, it may reduce it. I just don't know. But in 30 weeks, right now, I don't think we have enough data that Mavicampton influences uh, wall thickness. Thank you. Um, from another one of our cardiologists, um, Dr. Tim Camp, fantastic. Uh, how does genotype fit with the different forms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, obstructive versus non-obstructive, and response to therapies? So I can answer. He's talking about. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, so I can answer the second part easily that we don't know about response to therapy. But going back to the uh, first part is, uh, I think. So in early studies, uh, folks had decided that certain troponin mutations presented with very little uh, thickening, that is very little hypertrophy, and with a more malignant uh, electrical phenotype. That is, there was higher rates of sudden cardiac death in that group. While beta-mycin heavy chain, which is the most common mutation that we see, uh, presents with a lot of hypertrophy, obstruction, and not so, much, uh, uh, not so much sudden cardiac death, more heart failure. Now, in transgenic mice, that is in fact true. In certain families with those mutations, that is in fact true. But if you take all comers, we see a lot of overlap. So I think it does not unfortunately inform on how a patient would present or on susceptibility for complications, including sudden cardiac death. Thank you. And then just a, a couple of shout outs I haven't mentioned yet. Dr. Jim Stein, superb talk. Dr. Mohammed Hamden, excellent talk uh, for which I concur. Uh, and then uh, one uh, next question, um, acquired um, VWD, a loss of, uh, this is some um, blood disorder, it has, rarely been has rarely been associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Do you have any insights into how this about how common this is in various subtypes, it's von Willebrand's disease. So acquired von Willebrand's disease has really been associated with this. So uh, any insight into how common this is and in in what subtype dominates? 
Sorry about that. No, I've I've read those uh, case reports, but no, I don't uh, I don't have a lot of knowledge, and and uh, I'd be lying if I thought I did. No, I'm sorry, but but I think we're it's I'm curious, but at this point, other than the the few case reports, I I don't have a lot more to offer. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Sheehan, for saving me with Von Willebrands. Um and I think that that is the end of our questions. You know, Ted, this was fantastic, and we really appreciate you coming in um, on WebEx. We wish you were here in person, and Absolutely. maybe another time uh, you can visit us in Madison. So thank you very much. And with that, that uh, we will end. Thank you, Dr. Trowbridge, and thank you, Dr. Hamden, again. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Thank you, Ted. Take care. Thanks, Mohammed. Bye. And thanks, Clint. Yeah.